Hello and welcome back to yet another in-depth product review. Today's review is going to be a little bit different from what I usually do on this channel because the product is actually relatively new. Now I don't usually recommend used products this early in their life cycle because the prices are still on the downswing and a purchase today could mean a major loss not far down the road, but when the opportunity presented itself to acquire a Surface 3, I knew that this would be a great opportunity to discuss the topic of lightweight computing, which is something that I haven't had a chance to share that much about here on the channel. So with that, I present the complete and comprehensive review of Microsoft's Surface 3. Let's take a look. I'll pick this up and check this out. All right, this is it, the Surface 3 Not Pro. Before I even attempt to review this thing, let's talk about what the product actually is so that we can manage our expectations. For those of you not familiar, Microsoft in 2012 launched its own line of portable computers to coincide with its release of Windows 8. The goal was to show the world the versatility of their latest computer operating system, and in my opinion, it wasn't a bad idea. A duo of extremely thin yet capable machines that could go anywhere and allow the user to do anything. But to really understand the form factor, we need to take a step back even further to the original classic netbook computer. Between 2006 and 2011, almost every OEM had one. A cheap, tiny laptop with excellent battery life, a 10 inch 1024 by 600 screen usually, a single core Intel Atom, 1 to 2 gigabytes of RAM, and a basic installation of either Windows XP, Vista, or 7, whatever was in vogue at the time. It was a case of the right concept, but the technology just not being there for it. Those computers worked, yeah, but the chipset was agonizingly slow, and the ones with only one gigabyte of RAM were borderline unusable. Even the name was misleading. Netbook implied that they would be ideal for browsing the web, but it was unfortunately around that time when the web started going from overweight to obese before finally setting on the state that it currently exists in today, and the thrifty little chipsets just couldn't keep up. With the release of Windows 8 back in 2012, classic netbooks actually kind of fell off the map for a while. The OEMs probably just figured that the netbook craze was over and that it was time to move on to something different. It wasn't until Microsoft introduced the pricey Surface Pro and Surface RT laptops that the light bulb once again lit up for everybody else. You see, the Surface Pro had the high end of the spectrum covered for its wealthier buyers, but they left the proverbial door just flapping in the breeze with the Surface RT. And just a quick recap for those of you who don't know, the Surface RT was the consumer grade PC on which Microsoft introduced an ARM based version of its previously x86 exclusive Windows operating system. The port was actually a remarkable success, but they left out just one minor detail and that was the ability for developers to actually compile apps for the thing. Developers, 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 developers. Yeah, whoops. They screwed up what must have been an absolutely massive undertaking by failing to officially allow software to actually be made and published for the platform. The whole point of Surface RT was that between Internet Explorer, the free pack-in copy of Office Home and Student Edition, and the built-in Windows accessories, users were just expected to be satisfied with what was pre-installed. And look, I'm not one of those nonsensical, die-hard Internet Explorer haters. It is better than nothing, but keep in mind that there's no ad blocking available for Internet Explorer on RT. And it's at this point when one finally considers all of the other limitations of this restriction. Without verging too far off topic, it is worth mentioning that a few dedicated folks over on the XDA developers community forums have ported a number of useful programs unofficially to the RT, including Putty, 7-Zip, Audacity, and FileZilla, as well as a BitTorrent client, a KeyPass password manager, a Texas Instruments calculator emulator, and a couple of 8- and 16-bit game console emulators, but no major web browsers, video players, or XBMC. With that in mind, hardware companies set out to build a somewhat affordable featherweight computer that could master the secret balance and succeed where Microsoft had failed. Turned out that this was more difficult than it sounded. Microsoft went with ARM on the original Surface for a reason. While Intel had stepped up its game with superior dual-core Atom-based chipsets, 
the performance was still just a tad bit lacking and other forces were driving up the prices for these types of machines. No longer were customers content with 10 inch 1024 by 600 screens and one gigabyte of RAM. They wanted more vertical resolution, faster performance, better quality, and even touch screens. And to be fair, those demands were partially met, but they came at a cost. Still, these early efforts went to show that Intel wasn't a write-off for the passively cooled ultra-mobile computing year just yet. While Microsoft let the ARM-based offerings sell for another cycle, even they saw the writing on the wall and knew that it was time to get back to x86. Back to their roots, so to speak. So they drew up plans for an all-new piece of hardware that you might have already guessed the name of. Don't get me wrong, this product is not without its flaws, and we'll get into those, but I think that this Microsoft design, built by the familiar faces at Pegatron in China, who also manufacture the infamous iPad, gets the formula closer to perfection than anybody else. Big, bright screen, portability, insanely long battery life, and finally, just enough performance to comfortably be able to browse the web and get stuff done. When companies promised the netbook over 10 years ago, this is what people wanted. But you know what they say, it's all about the journey and not the destination. Which is why I've spent so long leading up to this point so that we can all silently relish and enjoy the gravity of what this thing truly represents. Now, as we go along here, I'm going to be drawing comparison to the Lenovo ThinkPad Tablet 2, which is a similar device released just a couple of years earlier in 2013. And the first distinction to make is that of the mechanics of the thing. You see, what all the Surface ripoffs never quite figured out how to do was the whole issue of propping up the computer. Since the form factor now mimics that of a tablet, designers kind of gave themselves a pass and really more or less opted out of that particular stage of the design, completely failing to realize that it was one of the most important steps. Now, it took Microsoft a few tries to get it right too, with the first surfaces being limited to one steep angle, but they always had the right idea. Honorable mention goes to Fuhitsu and their Q702, which utilized a thicker keyboard that had a secondary battery installed, solving two problems in one. But most everybody else couldn't bring themselves to do that. The ThinkPad Tablet 2 uses a Bluetooth keyboard that can only prop it up at one extremely steep angle, making it completely unusable as a laptop and a bit annoying even on a tabletop. The Surface 3's kickstand can be opened at one of three angles, depending on the position of operation. Yeah, it would be nice to have granular control like on a laptop, but the presets actually aren't all that bad, and it's thanks to this and other design ingenuity that allows the snap-on keyboard to be propped up at a more ergonomical angle. The optional but mandatory keyboard accessory also doubles as a protective cover for the screen, making the size of the entire package extremely manageable for even the lightest of travelers. So let's get on to the connectivity and specifications. Classic netbooks never had the greatest of connectivity, but even they were like desktop PCs compared to this thing. One lonely USB port, a miniature display port connector, and a micro USB slot for connecting to a mains adapter is all this computer has for connectivity. But it does have one neat trick up its sleeve, that being that the micro USB port actually supports USB host which means that it can be used with an adapter to provide the user with at least one more USB port. There's also a micro SD card slot hidden behind the kickstand. On the top, there's a power button and volume keys. Unfortunately, there are no power or storage access indicator lights, so it's sometimes a bit difficult to tell the current power state or gauge the disk usage. In essence, it's difficult to tell what the computer is actually doing, sometimes especially in the increasingly ambiguous Windows ecosystem. There is, however, a bright indicator light next to the webcam, near which there is also an ambient light sensor to allow for intelligent control of the display's backlight by the operating system. It's all adorned by an attractive and finely crafted casing. At some point, somebody decided that computers needed to be works of art, and this thing is no exception to that rule. It's so nice, in fact, that I'm almost afraid to use it at risk of scratching up the device's fancy finish. That finish, by the way, isn't all that spectacular in terms of grip, but with the type cover attached, the risk is largely mitigated, at least during transportation of the device. 
Spec-wise, the computer is powered by a state-of-the-art Intel Atom X7 Z8700 chipset, which features a 64-bit quad-core processor, Intel graphics, and either two or four gigabytes of what is believed to be DDR3 memory, as well as a flash storage volume of either 64 or 128 gigabytes worth of capacity. All this technology, along with a sizable internal battery pack, powers the experience for a 10.8 inch Panasonic display panel. Like the panel found on the ThinkPad Tablet 2, this display is extremely bright, has excellent contrast, and features outstanding out-of-box calibration. But it gets even better, because not only is it even brighter, breaking 400 nits, it also has an insanely high resolution of 1920 by 1280 which at first glance sounds either really weird or like a mistake, so let me unpack that a bit. Starting with the Surface 3 and Pro 3, Microsoft finally saw the merits of less wide resolutions. It's a little known fact that the squarer the screen, the more square inches you get per diagonal inch. In other words, a 10 inch 16.9 screen will be smaller than a 10 inch 3.2 screen, which is what this is. If you do the math, it comes out to being somewhere between 4.3 and 16.10, which provides a great overall balance, even if 16.9 videos played full screen have thin black bars at the top and bottom. It's just one of the ways in which this tablet gives more for less, and it's a refreshing aspect ratio to see on a newer computer. The high resolution means that use of Windows' still kind of buggy scaling features are necessary, but on single display setups, it works pretty much flawlessly at this point, especially for applications that are optimized to work properly on high density monitors. Turn it up. So what's the actual experience like? Shockingly good, actually. I never thought that I'd be able to do this much on a passively cooled netbook class computer. Take a quality web browser like Pale Moon and couple it with a good ad blocking add-on, and this thing handles the morbidly obese web remarkably well. At very least, it does its job significantly better than both its early forerunners and even the ThinkPad Tablet 2, which itself didn't do a half bad job considering its power consumption. In fact, this thing benchmarks up to 60 to 75% as powerful as the original Surface Pro, so that's saying something. Really, the worst part of the whole experience is probably the keyboard. Not the actual keys, those are kind of okay if a little noisy, but the little rectangle below the keys, the trackpad, is where the problems really start to show up. I'm personally a big stickler for trackpads, and I'm extremely picky about them, so it's perhaps not the biggest surprise that I was disappointed by the type cover's pointing device. It's not the surface or the responsiveness, as those aspects are actually quite good, but rather the sheer weirdness of its shape. It's just way too wide for how short it is. And the thing is that I could forgive this if it wasn't for the fact that the clicker buttons are embedded into the tracking area itself. I personally like to rest my thumb on the buttons as I track, so this makes the effective vertical tracking area less than three quarters of an inch high. It's like trying to track on a couple of popsicle sticks that have been taped together. That combined with the fact that the invisible boundary for the right click area requires way too much movement of the thumb in order to reach it without practice adds up to a steep and annoying learning curve combined with the necessary disabling of most of the tap and gesture settings, as useful as they may or may not be, simply because there's no way for the thing to be able to tell the difference between clicking and dragging and doing some kind of two-finger zooming gesture. Overall, it's about as useful as the funky optical track point on the ThinkPad Tablet 2, as both devices did score an average mouse accuracy index of 10. To briefly address the issue of video playback, I can say with complete confidence that the Surface 3 is powerful enough to play the challenging X265 encoding of video, even at 1080p resolution, which means if you have any X265 encoded videos, they will play fine on the Surface 3, hardware accelerated by the GPU that's in there. It was a brand new feature when that chipset was first released, which is why it's so unique that it has this kind of bleeding edge technology in there at a decent price. 
Finally, let's circle back to what I was going on about at the beginning of the review and talk about value. Being a newer device, the Surface 3 is still priced a little high for what it is, even though Microsoft has stopped selling it new on their website. As of third quarter 2017, working units are holding steady at around $185 to $250 or more, depending on whether or not the type cover keyboard is included. It's important to understand that this essential accessory was always a mandatory add-on, but still a separate add-on nonetheless for some inexplicable reason. At any rate, if you get one of these machines without the type cover, it's an expensive thing to have to replace, especially when you consider how cheap it feels. Seriously, the finish looks like somebody stretched an old rag over a clipboard. That said, unlike some of the other pieces of equipment that I've reviewed recently, the ultimate question of value on this computer is a tough one to answer, and possibly even the wrong one to be asking in the first place. Instead, I think that it really comes down to a question of purpose, and with the Surface 3 that purpose is convenience. If you own another computer, the Surface is probably slower, less richly equipped, and even inferior in terms of screen size, but what it is, is just powerful enough to be tolerable for light to medium weight tasks, long lasting enough to be useful away from its power supply for an extended period of time, and portable enough to take almost anywhere. It's certainly not the most powerful machine for the money, not by a long shot, but it is the most powerful, long lasting featherweight that can actually get things done without being too outlandishly expensive. Whether or not that kind of portability, convenience, and battery life are worth the nearly $200 price tag at this point is up to you, but it's certainly a well-crafted computer with some refreshingly good internals to back it up, and I think that it's something that the industry has been waiting on for a long, long time.